Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Not So Small Business webcast. We're your hosts. I'm Brian Moran. And I'm Kelly Brosna. Welcome. Welcome, Kelly. Uh, this month's webcast is all about New Jersey restaurants. And we'd like to welcome our guest today, Deborah Smith, president of Foxtrot Media, founder of JerseyBites.com, and author of the Jersey Shore Cookbook. Make sure you buy it. It's fantastic. Yeah. And with that, I want to welcome to the not so small business webcast, Deborah Smith. Hello, Deb. Thank you. Hey, how are you guys? We're fantastic. I, I think I'm going to have to check out this Jersey Shore cookbook that you awesome. have. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I yeah. have a copy of it over there, Jersey but I'm tethered to the cuisine. computer. <laughs> What's that? I didn't know that Jersey Shore had a cuisine, so that's that's good. It's Yeah, it's it's called from the uh, for the boardwalk and beyond um and it's really just showcasing 50 different restaurants from keyport to cape may that are that are on the jersey shore that they reside in towns that actually touch the ocean so that was my concept and my scope of work and that's how i was i was going to stick to it because people wanted me to come inland and feature their restaurant and that restaurant but i said no it's got to touch the ocean yeah. No, that's awesome because uh, and obviously, you know, highlighting the restaurants are key. They're truly, yeah. truly still struggling uh, with all that's going on. So uh, I'm going to enjoy our conversation today. So good. I'm looking forward. Yeah. To well, Deb knows New Jersey restaurants. I'll tell you that she uh, <laughs> been working intimately with them for the last two years. Right. Yeah. We'll get into that. So. Hi, yeah. Kelly. Ladies first, why don't you start us off? All right. So your company, Foxtrot Media, is a digital marketing agency that specializes in social media for restaurants mm -hmm. and hospitality market. Again, just stating the, the obvious that restaurants are truly, truly still, you know, struggling during COVID. And now hopefully we're in the aftermath of COVID, but you never know. For the past two years, you focused exclusively on New Jersey restaurants, which obviously is a key interest for us. It's an industry that's, um, as I mentioned, very hard hit. What can you tell us about what you've learned with working with restaurants since the pandemic? And, and maybe talk about a few examples of, we really like to hear success stories of maybe some, sure. some businesses that have made it out that, um, that you were able to help along the way. Yeah, um, plenty have. And um, you know, I think the first thing that we learned when um, the restaurants were ordered to lock their doors um, on, on, um, February, what was it? 16th, the day before, um, no, March 16th, sorry. The day before, um, St. Patrick's day parade, uh, oh my gosh, St. Patrick's day. Sorry. Um, we learned that first of all, how to panic, right? <laughs> Cause everybody was in panic mode. Um, all of our clients, nobody knew what was coming. A lot of us were, um, extremely, um, naive about when we were going to get out of it. You know, we thought, oh, it's going to be two weeks. It's going to be a month. And so, you know, some of my clients had never really concentrated on doing takeout. You know, a lot of the restaurants, they've got liquor licenses. They make their big money with people coming in and sitting at the bar. And, you know, takeout was just kind of an afterthought. And all of a sudden they had to rethink their whole takeout strategy. And a lot of them had just still, you know, answering the phone, taking takeout orders. And so it was a huge, you know, mind shift in like, we've got to get digital with this. We've got to get so people can place their orders online and that we can really become a machine with our takeout. So I saw a lot of our clients, you know, you know some of the POS systems like Toast really got, came into play there and they stepped up and they, um, you know, they fast tracked a system so that even if you weren't a Toast uh, client, you could still use their online ordering system and get up and running with online ordering. So we saw a lot of, I, I feel like I saw a lot of like by the seat of your pants kind of, you know, just making it happen with restaurants and the, the, the rules were constantly changing. You didn't know, you know, how far feet apart your tables were supposed to be or, you know, with outside dining and all of that stuff. It just was, you know, having to have regulations changing in the town so that you could do outdoor dining. There was so much going on at all, all times, right? It was constantly just juggling, 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 juggling um, and praying for a normalcy to come back. And boy, did it take a lot longer than, than we ever imagined. 
right? Sure, well, years. <laughs> right, right. And, and um, yeah, and with those starts and stops and, and, you know, COVID subsiding and then COVID coming back and, you know, masks are off and now they're back on again. And just so much that, that restaurants and patrons had to deal with, you know, uh, tempers were very, very <laughs> short, you know, fused so, with everyone. Um, so along those lines then, Deb, um, did restaurants lean on you as like more of a trusted advisor? I mean, you came in and you were talking to them about digital strategies, right? Mm -hmm. and, and bringing your business online. And whereas it wasn't clicking in January of 2020, all of a sudden in March, you're like, all right, what was the name of that woman? We need to get her back in here right now. And so did you find that suddenly... Um, they were asking you all sorts of questions, not only about- Yeah, I, I do. I, I, I became more of a partner mm -hmm. with a lot of my clients during that time um, and really helped help them navigate through a lot. And if I didn't have the answers, I was out there trying to find the answers for them. Um, you know, I had some clients call me and say, look, we can't afford to pay you because, you know, and, and some clients I worked with for several months, you know, with not charging because I knew they needed our help. Um, but thankfully, you know, most of my clients made it through unscathed. I mean, I say unscathed that, you know, they, I think they lost some hair and they, they definitely, everybody got a little grayer and, um, but they've come out the other side healthy and, and a lot of them are growing. A lot of them are, are, um, you know, purchasing new property and, and continue to want to grow, which is fantastic, you know, and some of them have taken advantage of the fact that other restaurants didn't survive, you know, so there there's property available and liquor licenses available. So um, those that have the capital are able to start, you know, expanding. So, and I know that you, you talked about most of your clients, you know, fortunately um, came Making through, it, you know, right. yeah, came, came through. Um, I think we all have some battle scars with, with all yeah. of us. I'm just curious, did you ever look and compare the, the work that you did compared to, for example, New York, right? I mean, everybody everybody heard about New York, New York, New York, right? And we've done some stats and, and I actually did a presentation and looked at the, the rates and we mirrored New York, we're a little bit slower if you put in perspective the, the population, right? Difference mm -hmm. there. We mirrored exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. But we actually had here in New Jersey more deaths per capita than New York did. Um, so I'm curious to see is, you know, you were targeting specifically New Jersey businesses. Did you ever look and see the comparison about um, what you did, the work that you did compared to a, a New York in the business survival rate that was in there? No, no, I really, no, I haven't done that. Um, you know, I, I do see that, all right, I felt it in just my own communities that we actually um, reap the benefit of people wanting to get out of New York. Sure. Yeah. You know, so um, our populations have swelled. I, like I live at the Jersey shore and so many people with Jersey shore homes decided might as well move there now, you know, or might as well just become a full-time resident there now. Sure. So we've seen a lot of people yeah. and we've seen a lot of even restaurants move out of New York city and into New Jersey. So um, I think in a way we've, we've, we've reaped some benefits in that way. Um, you know, I know property values sky high and, um, and you can't find a home that people are, you know, having bidding war still over homes right. around here. So, um, you know, I never compared how, I, I always felt that they had it worse off than our restaurants here in New Jersey. You know, they had such they were so tightly compacted and um and i know they had to show their their vax cards like we never get that got that far here um with that kind of thing and they also didn't have as much out, outdoor space that a lot of our our restaurants have you know some of our restaurants tripled their their table capacity once they got to do outdoor dining right yeah well and we've seen some that you know even because of all that was going on, this, the cities, the townships, the boroughs, whichever you whichever you live in here in New Jersey, because right. there's a plethora of different options here, right? But they even um, sort of lessened their, um, I guess, their their regulations, I guess, would say letting sidewalks be used right. as, as outside dining just to sort of help those businesses. Yeah. 
every town had to kind of cobble together some kind of strategy. And it's and it, every town is different, like you said. So where I live in, in Point Pleasant Beach, our main thoroughfare or our most um, touristy kind of street is actually a state road. So our mayor who wanted to make it easy for everyone to be able to keep him stay in business and to do outdoor dining, it wasn't up to him. It was up to this, you know, who, whoever manages the state road. So we had to obviously go to the state and get approvals for that. And so there's a bunch of things that constantly were having to be negotiated and renegotiated um, to, to keep that, that outdoor space available. And it was still pretty limited, you know, I mean, I've had clients where they can take over a half of a parking lot. That is a huge parking lot with tents and tables and really, um, you know, did very well over the summer, even when they weren't allowed to have indoor dining. It, it, you know, that, that sounds like a good silver lining to all of this, right. That they right. pivoted and that they were able to establish this and, and even keep them as the restaurants started to reopen and businesses started to reopen for indoor dining. Um, what were some other, and, and by the way, I never really put it together that the Jersey shore would benefit the way they did um, for people leaving the city and leaving, you know, northern New Jersey, say, to go to the beach. Right. That, and that makes total sense. And guess um, what? They all love to dine out. They all love good restaurants and they love to, you know, get out and dine. So um, it's a good thing for restaurants in this area. Oh, absolutely. And, and so what was, were there any other like silver linings that you saw uh, that restaurants, maybe other than the, um, you know, creating that digital presence and, and being able to pivot the way they did? I, I mean, I think the overall overarching silver lining is that we can live through anything. Yes. We have, we have literally survived the worst pretty much, you know, for a restaurant, for, for owning a restaurant. We have gotten through stuff that no, you know, nobody's ever seen before. And for that, I think it is a it kind of just like I live in Point Pleasant Beach. We live through Hurricane Sandy. We compare everything to Hurricane Sandy now. Yes. You know, ah, that's that's a it's your, it's your benchmark. It's your benchmark. Yeah, it's my benchmark. You know, and that's true. Like I, my house here, I said I'm gonna when I finally put it on sale, it's gonna say Sandy proof. You know, because nothing happened to it. Um, but that's I feel like that's how restaurateurs that survived it feel as well. Is that you know we can do anything. Right. So um, I have to feel that is the biggest over uh, overarching silver lining. Um, and then there's just also they've just learned how to pivot and to and to just, you know, make things up when other things aren't working and, and really, like I said, fly by the seat of their pants. Um, we also learned how to, OK, figure out what's going to bring us more reliable money once we could bring people back in. And that was private parties. You know, so yeah. private parties is where a restaurant can really plan their their purchasing of food and and know that they're not going to have any waste, um, that they're going to be paid up front for what they're ordering and at least 50 percent or whatever they, they require. And um, they ne they always just kind of like sat back and said, oh, private parties, well, they come when they come. And we've just kind of, if our clients can and have the ability to um, handle private parties, we've been very proactive in pushing that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, advertising, getting in front of people on a regular basis, like we have these capabilities and, and we've done some really successful ad campaigns um, that have brought in these private party bookings. And that's a real safety net um, for, you know, it's very hard to rely on a la carte business um and you know especially with food costs right now and everything else it's it's nice to have some you know guarantees that's a great silver line in your back pocket yeah so i am interested though in in boy would i like to just stop talking about covid and the pandemic yeah. and all of that right I, I would love to close that book right and it's not one i would ever like to reopen again Never. but but you know in terms of moving forward, you know, so let's, let's uh, shift a little bit and talk about what are you seeing in terms of, of the recovery and the growth in the restaurant sectors? What sectors are growing the most, I guess, is um, within the restaurant industry. Um, but also I want to add a little, a uh, little added on, I'd like to add a little on to that, meaning how many restaurants have have taken on to collaborate with other businesses as well because 
you know, it takes a village, right? You know, mm -hmm. so restaurants, you know, working with wedding parties and event planners and, you know, or flowers, you know, floral, mm -hmm. you know, if you're going to do weddings or if you're going to do graduations or you're going to do all that stuff. Are you seeing any growth in collaboration? Because I'm all about collaborating and I yeah. love the fact. So, so two part, you know, what is the, what are the segments that are growing? And then maybe we could talk a little bit about, um, you know, is that happening or, you know, how do we move into that direction where, where businesses can look at collaborating with other types of businesses that they can go in and all mutually benefit from? Right, right. I see a lot of that, by the way, but okay, right. starting with the um, what's growing. Um, I mean, I, I personally see a lot of the uh, kind of gastro pubs, taverns kind of um, being a place where people tend to want to dine out most these days. Um, you know, I think fine dining is really having a tough time. And I think fine dining really had a tough time during COVID. Um, and a lot of fine dining restaurants kind of did that pivot into more of a casual um, gastro pub or, you know, tavern kind of um, atmosphere. Um, Nicholas is one the ones that I'm thinking of um, in Monmouth County, who was famously a, a fine dining restaurant forever and just recently completely rebranded into something more casual. Interesting. Um, the um, I, I, people's pocketbooks are, you know, I don't know. I just feel like we're more casually oriented and we, we go out to dinner far more than we did like in the seventies. And, you know, when it was the big night that you went out for a holiday or a birthday or something like that. And I think restaurants are realizing, Hey, we want people to come back three times a week. Right. You know, we, we don't want this, the, the celebratory visit, you know? Um, and then I think the other segments, obviously that came, especially think that came out of COVID were the ghost kitchens. Um, and we're seeing that popping up everywhere. And that's where a lot of, um, restaurants are collaborating, where they're renting out their kitchen space, um, for another, you know, food establishment that's just going to do takeout. Um, or you're seeing, I've, I've got a new client that, um, is, uh, down in Cherry Hill and they are, um, they've developed this whole, uh, takeout concept It's 10 different restaurants under one roof that is all takeout and it's in an industrial park. It's not even, you know, it's not no walk by traffic or anything like that. Um, and it's all basically it's online. It's a digital restaurant you order and and they deliver or you can pick up at their at their facility um seeing a lot of those kind of takeout oriented places because of covid right that's interesting and you said one thing about how fine dining has sort of shifted in their rebranding and i suppose part of that too is is the cost of beef and yeah. you know and and plus the protein we'll just say protein mm -hmm. in general Mm -hmm. um, that has, that has gone up. And I suppose that, you know, it's hard to want to go spend $70 on a steak, right. Yeah. You know, when you go 70's to these cheap, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it shows you how long, you know, yeah. You um, know, yeah. Been, yeah. And, and also you look at too, there's a lot of plant-based eaters now, you know, there's a lot of people that are not eating steak. Um, you know, it's a, it's a very varied diet for a lot of people. And, You've got, you know, maybe you've got a vegan in the house or a vegetarian in the house. You can't go to a steak house, really, um, unless they've started to offer some of those those other options. You know, um, I mean, they're still out there. There's still there's still some, you know, that are always going to be there because they're just institutions. Um, but mm -hmm. I think some of some have seen, uh, you know, there's one in Fairhaven that I don't think he ever uh, opened back up, but he was fine dining. Um, and was there for many, many years. So, um, you know, that's just what, that's what I'm seeing. Um, yeah, I, I, like I agree with you that, that I think uh, consumer behavior changed dramatically yeah. in the last two years. Um, I remember reading um, a, a study recently about Starbucks, 70% of their orders now are to go, mm. 70%, you know, and they built these, these, stores that you know allow for you know people to congregate and, yeah. and and they're not doing that anymore it's get it and go and you know to your point about the restaurants you know it's it's get it and go and you know you're starting to rethink do i need this much space for in in you know room dining um 
which which is going to lead to other costs associated with restaurants, right? And and certainly with the variable costs, the rent, light, and heat of your establishment. The good news is that, and I'm going to pivot just slightly here, that there's a bill that's moving through Congress right now. You know, you talked about uh, uh, the spending habits of consumers. Well, interest rates went up a second time recently and went up half a point. And the worry is that it's it's going to go up again and again and again, that the Fed is, is going to continue to raise rates until consumers stop spending as much as they are and we can bring inflation you know, back in check. That has to worry restaurant owners uh, tremendously, right? And so there's a bill now that's moving its way through Congress. Um, it's the second, it's like part two of the Restaurant Revitalization Fund, right? It's, it's about $42 billion that, and, and a lot of these restaurants, they were in the, in the system to get the money when, it, when they ran out. Now, this is going to help restaurants tremendously. Now, do you see something like that, some, some sort of cash infusion into these Jersey Shore restaurants that would help them navigate inflation, lower consumer demand? And where do you think they would spend that money? Would it be to well, what are the back? restrictions on spending? Where are they supposed to? Because all of these come with caveats as far as what you can spend the money on, right? Yeah. It, it's operating part, I, costs. You know, it's, right. it, they've loosened it uh, quite a bit. You know, like you know, PPP used to be, you know, it was just, uh, you know, employees and, employees. and then they extended it when they realized that they were also paying employees not to work. So like, yeah. all right, we're going to switch this up. So there, there's a fair amount that restaurants can do with it. Uh, you know, pay their, I think it's pay their employees. It's operating expenses. Uh, I, mean, and rent, so, I mean, if they can pay their mortgages or they can pay their rents, that's going to be a huge relief for a lot of them. Maybe there's a lot, some of them might be still catching up on rents and, yeah. you know, and, and that kind of thing. Um, getting themselves out of debt or, or less uh, in, in less debt yeah. might be a, a real relief. Um, I still think that their biggest things that they are struggling with right now is the supply chain and staffing. Yeah. Now staffing's gotten a little better. I mean, it was really bad. And I mean, but it's still it, kitchen help is so hard to find. Kitchen is just, you know, it is tough. Um, and, you know, how do you run a restaurant without your kitchen? Mm, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's really tough. You know, a lot of people can step in and, and be a server. You know, you can grab your cousins and whoever you need in the, in the, in the front of the house. But, you know, not everybody knows how to cook and uh, it's just been a real struggle. And then the cost of everything, um, you know, food costs are just just absolutely strangling these restaurants. And like for for instance, for Valentine's Day, you know, I've got one seafood place where everybody goes for lobster on Valentine's Day. And he says, I can't get lobster. I, I'm paying for lobster wholesale what I would normally charge my customers for lobster. Now I'm going to have to charge like 80 bucks for a lobster. And because nobody, I think it's when COVID had just hit Canada and nobody was working the docks and blah, blah, blah. You know, there's a million things that affect the supply chain. And so it's, then they have to decide, well, do I want to, do I first have to invest in this food that might not sell because it's so expensive and I might be throwing it away or I'm going to get it, but I'm going to have to charge so much for it you know, or am I just going to have to not offer it at all? You know, take these things off the menu. I know so many of my clients have taken crab off the menu, crab cakes, crab, so expensive right now that you just can't get a crab cake. And I love crab cakes. I love crab cakes too. Damn. It's one of the few seafood I'm not allergic to. Um, so it's yeah. just those kind of things. Like even when they get this money, I guess they'll be able to, you know, they'll be able to buy this food, but still they have to turn a profit on this food. So I see it more like operations, like, you know, paying down debt, paying, being able to pay their mortgage, that kind of stuff. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. And they're not going to turn it away. It's going to be a help, whatever they get, you know? Absolutely. But it, is, but it is nice to hear that the employee issue is, is calming down a little bit because, you know, with the businesses that we work with in the, I'm just going to say in general across the board service industry, 
hiring, retaining people are the, the hardest because they're it's not always hard. been that way. Right. Yeah. I mean, retaining yeah, them, they can bounce wherever they want to bounce. Right. But, but they weren't getting the people coming in. I mean, I I've seen places closed and with signs out there that says, can't, can't find people to work, you know I mean? Yeah. So signs are still out there. They're still, it's still tough. And we were finding too, is that, you know, you get applicants that will apply online and then never show up for the interview. Or they, you know, they send in the resume and then the owners, so the owners spend so much time trying to track them down to get into for an interview that basically they just said, apply within, mm, show yeah. up, yeah. apply within, then we'll see, you know, if you're a real person and you really want to work, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you know? Well, and that's, a, that's interesting, but, but again, it's, I'm glad to hear that things yeah. are getting, you know, somewhat, somewhat better. And, you yeah. know, as we're looking forward to the summer, in a particular down the Jersey shore, um, you know, in potentially into the fall, I, I hate saying fall and we're not even right, right. right into summer yet and stuff, yeah. before holidays and stuff. What do you think, what are your, sort of your tips for these restaurants for them to be successful and succeed through some of this time? I don't think we're done just yet with, you know, a, a little bit of panic here and there, but right. you, you know, I don't think, I think the, the, the general sentiment and in, in of all populations of we're done, we're not shutting down again, period. Yeah. However, what that's going to look like going forward, you know, is going to be interesting. So what are some of your tips that you think that some businesses could sort of, um, I don't know, pandemic proof themselves that they can, you know, like your house is Sandy proof, you know? But, yeah, uh, I, I guess I feel like, you know, consistency is key for restaurants, right? So consistency in the product that they put out, consistency in their service. It's very hard to be that way. You know, people are people and, you know, server can have a bad day or bartender can have whatever it is, but concentrating on those two things is always, you know, your baseline. Right. Um, and then after that, and hopefully you can continue that so that people can rely on your establishment as, you know, it's going to be a good time. I know I'm going to have a good experience here. It's not, if, you know, I've heard a lot where it's, oh, it's good this one day, but then it's not so good. And that kills you, you know, mm. consistency is so key. Um, and then after that, of course, I'm a marketer. So I'm going to say market, you know, you can't sit back on your laurels and um, just expect people to come in. You know, I love when restaurants, you know, they poo poo the idea of marketing. That, oh, it's all word of mouth. We get all of our, you know, our clients through word of mouth. And I always say to them, what do you think social media is? Right. It's all word of mouth. Yeah. It's us yeah. talking to each it's other. Bigger mouth. You know? It's a bigger mouth. It's more <laughs> yeah. efficient. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. know, and then it also, you know, reviews, online reviews, those are, that is word of mouth because it's one person telling a whole lot of other people what their experience was at your establishment. So paying attention to those reviews, answering reviews, responding, you know, just even if it's a person that you think is, oh, this person is a nut. Yeah. Well, if you just respond to that review in a clear, clear head and say, we're so sorry you had a bad experience, please reach out to our manager. Here's her email. Just that alone, other people will see that response and will yeah. say, oh, this establishment actually cares about, you know, its, its customers. That's all you need to do. It, it's that don't pick a fight and don't ignore it. Um, just address it and, and say, we like, we always want to try to fix things, you know, yeah. and that's it. Hey, 95% of the time, they never reach out to the manager. And the one, the 5% that do, you usually can turn them around into a good review down the line. Well, and that's interesting. I always wondered, you know, because I don't see a whole lot of restaurants these days pushing for reviews, mm. you know, um, and I just think that it's kind of like when you're on your social media and your LinkedIn, you want people to, to give you reviews. So if you're looking for a job, if you're, you know, whatever, mm. I, I just don't see a lot. Like when I go to a restaurants, I never see them handing a little piece of paper. We'd love to give you a review. Or right. I mean, it's not a whole lot to right. do to get people to do it. And, and, you know, or even offer, give us a re review when your next visit, you get 10% off or, you know, whatever, right. whatever. Well, that's it kind is. of frowned upon with Google. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> is yeah. It? Um, yeah. You can't incentivize reviews. Mm. Um, but what I tell, what I tell um, my clients is that, you know, mentioning it to people that, you know, have had a great experience because, you know, at the end of the meal, they might say, oh, this was fantastic. Or, you know, your server was so great. Yeah. And just say, oh, 
you know what would be make our day if you could just leave a review it would really be helpful and if you could mention that server i'm sure they'd love it you know something like that where you're you're kind of getting them to help you they people yeah. like to help right mm. um and then on the on the flip side people love to leave reviews when they're ticked off like oh, that's sure. what that's where they're most incentivized to really you know lash out and so that's why you always constantly want to be include in, in, in um, encouraging those positive reviews because you've got to even out. Um, you know the yeah. negative ones are coming, right? It does that. That's just if the business of owning a restaurant. Um, so encouraging those positive reviews is so smart. But I think a lot of restaurants are afraid. They're just afraid of reviews in general, you know, yeah. and uh, don't want to ask or encourage any kind of review because they don't know what's coming. So well, there's a, a you know funny expression. If you like something, you'll tell 10 friends. But if you hate it, you'll tell everybody, you know. Yeah. Right, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, exactly. and I think you still see it. You see it a lot on it, like things like Instagram, you know, yeah. people taking pictures and posting it. So, you know, restaurants, and I'm sure you tell restaurants this, the hashtag game, you know, what's your, what's your hashtag that you can own that can create a library of your content on something like Instagram. Right. 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 So this, typically that's just the restaurant's name. You know, we don't, we don't try to make up hashtags um, that, you know, whatever, just the restaurant's name, or if it's a restaurant in the town, um, yeah. that kind of thing, just to, so it's all cataloged under that right. name. Yeah. Right. Um, well, let, let me do this because we, we we hit the home stretch way too fast on this webcast, which stinks. So we're gonna wanna we wanna have you back after the summer's over so we can talk okay. about what went right, what went wrong in the summer, and then we can talk about the upcoming holidays. How yes, and Kelly, we never talked about those collaborations that you wanted to talk about. So all right, that's yeah. part two. That's part two of our webcast. All right. So okay. that's our invitation to have you come back. Wonderful. Now, how can people connect with you because I know our, our viewers are saying, Brian, please ask her what her information is. So my company name is Foxtrot Media. You can find us at foxtrotmediallc.com. If you love to read about restaurants and food, uh, go to jerseybites.com. That's B-I-T-E-S.com. We will be celebrating our 15th anniversary this September. Wow. Um, yes, I know. I can't believe it's been 15 years. And, um, and then I'm on, I'm on Instagram as Jersey bites. So if you want to follow along on my journeys on to restaurants throughout the state, um, and on LinkedIn as Deborah L. Lee Smith, cause there's so many Deborah Smiths. Uh -huh. I think that's all. All right. That's fantastic. Well, good enough, right? Deb, you've been a great guest. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Very much. For, great talking to you guys. Yeah. And look forward to more great information coming Come out. visit us at the Jersey yeah. Shore this summer. Yes, we'll have to. We'll sure. have to go out to lunch. You don't even somewhere. have to twist my arm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm there. Kelly and I will meet you down there. How's there that? Go. For some uh, nice outdoor seating. Yes. I'm yes. in. Ocean. Yeah. I'm in. Well, I want to thank you again for, for thank being Thank you. Here. Thanks for having thank me so much. It's great. All that great information. And I'm glad to hear that your clients are doing well and, and they're navigating Me those too. uncharted waters. That's great. And for all our viewers and listeners out there, you've been listening to the Not So Small Business webcast. Thank you very much for your feedback, for your suggestions and all your kind words. We appreciate it very much. And your reviews. Uh, yes. Thank you for those. Only kind ones, please. You cannot <laughs> throw digital tomatoes at me. <laughs> um, but we hope that you come back next month for another episode of the Not So Small Business uh, webcast. You can also listen to our podcast twice a month uh, on the same website, Not So Small Business Podcast with Kelly and me. And uh, until then, uh, we wish you all the best and we look forward to reconnecting with you soon. Take care, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everybody.